Hello and welcome to part 9. Today we will work on our basic infrastructure for handling interrupts, we will learn how to write interrupt handlers and we will implement an interrupt service routine dispatching mechanism. In part 8 we discussed in detail about interrupts, about how to set up the interrupt descriptor table, but something that we haven't done yet is to actually implement any of these interrupts. And that's what we are going to do today. So how can we actually write one of these interrupt service routines and what's so special about them? Well, the answer is that they're normal functions just like any function written in C or C++. The difference is that it doesn't use any of the calling conventions typically used by C or C++. The CPU will push a couple of things to the stack, a couple of registers. It does this in order to save the state of the program that was running before the interrupt was fired. And also we have to return using a special instruction which is called IRET. The next question is, can we write this in C or do we need to use assembly? And the answer is that it's complicated. While technically we could write this in C, the problem is that we cannot call the IRET instruction from C. We could work around that by using inline assembly, but that would be very bad, because we may actually corrupt the stack and yeah, we may end up in a very bad situation. We could also use the interrupt attribute, which is something that's supported by GCC. But there are some advantages to doing this in assembly and we will see in just a moment what those advantages are. With this in mind, let's go ahead and start implementing isr.asm. There are many ways in which we could design our interrupt handlers. The design I settled on and I like the most is this one. All the interrupt handlers are simple stubs that jump to a common point which sets some things up and then a common C function is called. In C we will have an array of function pointers that will contain our own handlers written in C. I know this adds a layer of indirection, but it will make it much easier to write these handlers in C properly. And this is exactly what I'm doing here in this interrupt handler. First I am pushing the interrupt number and then I'm jumping to the common place. If we want to implement another interrupt handler, we would do it in the same manner just push the interrupt number to the stack and then jump to the common place. Now let's jump to interrupt handler number 8. This one has a bit of a particularity. If we look at the documentation we can see that this interrupt vector corresponds to the CPU exception double fault. For this particular exception, in addition to the, all the stuff that the CPU pushes to the stack, it will also push an error code. This is not something that the CPU does for every exception. There are some exceptions that have this error code and some exceptions that don't. So what can we do to keep our stack consistent? The simplest solution would be to simply push a dummy error code for all the interrupts that don't have this exception code. There are 256 interrupt vectors that we need to handle, but there's a smarter way of doing that. So let's not do this right now. Let's go to this common place. The first thing that we want to do here is to capture the state of the processor at the time when this interrupt is triggered. Why would we want that? If we have to handle an exception, we may want to know, you know, what address the CPU tried to access that caused the exception. Or if this is a system call, we want to know what arguments are being passed to this system call. Let's check the Intel manual to see what the processor actually gives us. This way we know what else we need to capture. I found this really useful figure in Volume 3, the System Programming Guide, Chapter 6, Interrupt and Exception Handling, in the Exception and Interrupt Handling section. So here we have two possibilities. If there is no privilege level change, what this means is that the interrupt occurs while the kernel is running, the processor keeps using the kernel stack and it pushes three or four things the flex register, the code segment, the instruction pointer and optionally the error code. The second possibility is that the interrupt occurs while a user land task is running. In this case, the processor has to switch its privilege level from ring 3 to ring 0. 
When this happens, the processor will switch to the kernel stack, which is stored in a structure called the task state segment. We will discuss this structure in a later video, but what is important for us today is that the processor will also push the stack segment and the stack pointer, in addition to all the other things. So, how can we tell if the privilege level changed? By looking at the code segment, since we set these up in the global descriptor table. In addition to all of this information, we will also want to capture the state of all the general purpose registers as well as the data segment. Since we don't use segmentation, all the extra segment registers, ES, FS, GS will have the same value as DS, which is why I only saved the DS register. Before passing control to the C function, we should make sure that the data segment is the kernel's data segment, since its value is not automatically changed by the processor. Now we can pass control to the C function, but not before pushing the stack pointer to the stack. This way we can pass to the C function as an argument a pointer to all the information that we have collected so far. We'll get to the C function in just a moment, but first let's do all the cleanup that we have to do. Let's remove the argument from the stack, then we restore the segment registers that we modified. and then we restore the general purpose registers. We also need to remove the interrupt number that we pushed and the error code. Finally, we can return using the special return instruction iret and the processor will take care of the rest. Now let's go into isr.h and see how we can handle all of this stuff from C. Let's start with the registers structure, which contains the state that we have recorded right here in this code. Now remember that the stack groans downwards. What this means is that we have to define here all the registers and all the things that we push to the stack, but in the reverse order in which they were pushed. So. Going here from the bottom to the top, we have to start with the data segment. Next we have this push A instruction, so we have to look at the documentation and see exactly what order the things are pushed in. So in reverse order they are EDI, ESI, EBP, ESP, EBX, EDX, ECX and EAX. Next is the interrupt number and the error code. And finally we have all the stuff that the CPU pushed. That is, in reverse order, EIP, the code segment, E-flags, ESP and the stack segment. Next I'll go to isr.c and define this isr handler function, which takes a pointer to a registers structure. For the moment, let's just print a message with the interrupt number that we got to see that everything is working properly. Now, we only took care of like 3 interrupts out of the 256, so let's go ahead and take care of the rest. Now, I don't want to write this stuff 256 times, so let's define some macros which would help with that. Since there are two cases here, we have certain interrupts that have error codes and certain interrupts that don't have error codes, I decided to create two macros, one for no errors and one for errors. In NASM, the syntax for macros is a percent sign macro, the name of the macro and then the number of arguments, which in our case is one, the interrupt number. Once we define these macros, all we have to do is simply call them instead of having to write all that code 
Now I'm lazy, and for me, having to write this for 256 lines of just ISR no error code and then ISR error code is too much work. So let's do this the smart way and create a little script which can generate the code for us. Now we could write this script in any language that we want. Uh, Python is a very good choice. We could write it in Perl, in Shell, in any other language that we want. But I did not want to introduce another dependency for our project, so I decided to use a shell script. So this is generate isrs.sh, which I placed in build scripts. The first thing I did here was to call set minus e. What this does is that it will exit the script automatically if any of the commands that we are calling fails. This way I don't have to check the error code of every everything I call. Next, I am checking the command line arguments. The way I thought about this is to pass the C and the assembly files that we are going to generate as command line arguments. I created two variables for the C and assembly files that we are going to generate. Okay, and I also defined a variable that contains a list of all the interrupt numbers that have error codes attached to them. This is something that can be found in the Intel manual as well as the OS dev wiki. We will also have a C file, I just left this section empty. We can start by adding a comment which says that this file is auto-generated. As you can see, I'm using echo to print text to the file and using the redirection operators to put it into the actual file. Next we will iterate over each of the 256 interrupts and we are going to check if it is in the isrs with error code uh, variable. If it is there, we have to call the isr error code macro, otherwise we have to call the isr no error code macro. As you can see here, when I'm calling grep, I'm using this backslash b, uh, which means a word boundary. A word boundary is basically either a space or a punctuation character, but it can also be the end of the line or the beginning of the line. If I didn't use it, uh, we would have problems with, for example, 2, which would match with 12. Let's give it a try and see what happens when we call it. Nice, this looks very good. Now let's continue with the C part and see what we need to generate for the C code. Here inside this isr.c we will also want to create an initialization method it will register all of these handlers that we have created. It will register them into the interrupt descriptor table. Here we will want to first declare all of these functions and then register them into the interrupt descriptor table. Now something that we need to think about right here is that for some interrupts we may want to use different flags than these ones that I set here. Now the good part is that we can modify the interrupt descriptor table after registering all of these gates, so I don't think that will be much of a problem. Now that we know what we need to write in our C code, let's also generate this file as well. Just like we did with the assembly file, I also added this uh, This file is auto-generated comment at the beginning. Um, in C we will also want to include a couple of things like idt.h and gdt.h. Then let's define this initialize gates function which does all of the stuff we did in initialize. And just like we did with the assembly code, let's iterate over all the 256 interrupts and then call this idt setgate function with the correct arguments. 
Now there is something I forgot to do here, which is to declare all of these 256 handlers. So this is exactly what I am doing right now. Great, we have the generation script, so all we have to do now is to call it from our makefile. First, I will add these generated files into the sources C and headers ASM variables, and the reason I'm doing this is because wildcard only works with files that exist, but these generated files may or may not exist, so in order for this code to always work, we have to add them separately. Then we can create a rule to generate both of these files at the same time. Finally, we have to include this assembly file that we generated into isr.asm. The C file will be compiled, so that's not an issue. Another thing that we haven't done is to call this isr initialize gates function from isr initialize. After calling this function, we will also need to go over each of the 256 entries and enable them because we haven't set the present flag. And of course, we also have to call isr initialize from hell.c. Let's see if this works. Uh, what I did here was I used some inline assembly to manually call some interrupts to see if they work. Yay, it works. Now let's take this a step further and implement the dispatching mechanism that I mentioned previously. I started by defining this function type ISR handler which takes a pointer to a register's structure. We will also have this register handler function, which will allow us to register these handlers. Now, going to isr.c, uh, let's define a handlers array which contains 256 isr handlers. So, if the isr handler for the current interrupt is not null, then we will simply call it otherwise we will print a message and simply hold the kernel because we got something that we did not expect. Now, if the interim number that we're getting is smaller than 32, that means that we have gotten an exception. Now, if this unhandled interrupt is an exception, we will also want to have some additional information printed out for us, like what register values we had, what the exception is, and it may also be a good idea to stop our operating system from doing anything else if this happens, because this may be a serious error. 
The panic function will just stop our operating system from running. To achieve that in an efficient manner, we have to disable interrupts using the CLI instruction and then hold the processor. In the next test, I wanted to delete all of these fake interrupts from main that we created and to actually trigger the processor to have an exception. And the simplest one is to simply cause a division by zero. All we have to do here is put zero in a register and then divide by that register. And we will see the division by zero error when we run this. Next, I try to trigger an overflow by putting some really big numbers in EAX and ETX and then dividing by a very small number. If the result of this division doesn't fit in a 32-bit register, the processor will panic and it will trigger another divide by zero error, as we can also see here. And here's another interesting thing. We can actually see the values that the registers had, like EAX, EBX, EDX, when this uh, crash happened. Next, I tried to generate another exception, uh, for example, the segment not present exception, which can be triggered when uh, we are trying to use a descriptor which doesn't exist in either the IDT or the GDT. And here's where I found a little bug in the ISR error code macro. Uh, instead of pushing the actual interrupt number, I always pushed 8, which was a bit of a problem. And now um, we are getting the correct segment not present error. That would be all for today. Thank you a lot for watching and you can find links to all the things that we talked about today in the video description below, as well as a link to our GitHub repository where you can find all the source code. And you can also find there a link to our Discord channel in case you have any questions. In the next video, we will talk about hardware interrupts. So have a nice day and see you the next time. Bye bye. That's it. Okay.